1. Dimensional Cosmology The Universe Since the Big Bang The universe began in the first dimension. There was a microwave vibration that occurred under the influence of uncertainty, and this caused everything. A single amount of the void spun around itself and split off, forming the first particle of karma, or quantum information unit. This particle was a singularity compared to nothing, and thus was compelled about itself with the combined weight of the fullness of the abyss, which was a great greatness. It was forced to begin to consume itself by the emptiness, and this it did with such haste that it began to implode with a force greater than that of the darkness, that is, that velocity known as the speed of a photon, and thus to bend the space-time within it as it had been bent from the null space and zero time of the void when it was conceived. This turned it inside out quickly, and filled it with light so that it shone then in the pitch. But these were not rays of photons, too slow in the darkness, and too easily consumed would they be, but the projection of astral light, that is, the microwave gravity particle tachyons, and these are projected as an outward rippling orb. It is said, then, that the finger of the Creator came down and touched the spot on the globe in the heavens from outside the space that was outside our universe at the moment of the Big Bang, so that it would be swept away with its generous to become proper space-time. Then it was the time of the second dimension, when the waves of tachyon luminous microwave gravity stirred the void up into action and caused more reactions that created particles. These are the events when the four forces were set down and everything had been called into spin. Time began then as a measurement of the spinning, a speed that could be measured by the velocity of a photon. Space was conception itself. A single point in null space would be drawn out and then turned about itself, creating polarity. A particle would spring into existence as a self-expanding wormhole tachyon torus in the vast expanse of the nether realm and immediately progenate a stream of similar shapes that would continue on filling in the lightlessness until they were all a solid throng occupying a region and causing by their continual exchange of motion between them, which asymptotically approached regulation, the oscillation of that great polarizing force we know as time. These tachyons tended to accumulate themselves then in a topical aura, since they were emanating outward from a center and so their region of most profound discourse was around the edge of their expansion. It is upon the surface of this three-dimensional shape expanding in the fourth spatial dimension that the story of our universe continues. By this time the four elemental genres of particles had been formed and this had given the light a fine quality invisible to the darkness that of all those less intense manifest fluctuations of those particles slower than the speed of light. This was the material universe that was becoming polarized as three-dimensional space on the surface of the fourth-dimensional inflation of tachyons. Once the third dimension began to appear out of the pure heat following the Big Bang, it rapidly accumulated masses in space similar to those underlying its own mechanisms of creation. These are, in order ascending outward from our planet, 
stars, galaxies, and the walls and voids. The planets and the stars are spheres. The stars emitting light and the planets reflecting it. The orbits of the planets around the stars and the orbits of stars around the centers of galaxies are both planar, that is, purely based on the polarization principle, that is, that elemental and temporal spatial opposites attract. In the case of stars and planets, this means the star is too weak to attract heavier bodies than the solidification of the fine layers of the gas cloud that surrounded it before its fire scorched them, making them curl up into spheres. In the case of stars and galaxies, that is, that those bastions of the lesser light all fall toward and are caught in the wake of a singularity, where microwave gravity has torn a hole in space-time, leading at the edges into hyperdimension, and in the center to the abyss outside. The walls and voids arrange themselves in random strands and gaps, the extended projection of the first spurts of probability in the infinite field of potential. The fourth dimension gives us time, this is the surface upon which we measure a beam of light as it is guided. It is homogeneous to the very small and the very large, though we recognize these terms to be relative to our perception, and it makes the smaller particles to move faster and the larger sphere to move slower, although we can project our understanding of the relativity of size onto the relativity of temporal durations. Again, it is only the measure of the averaged frequency over wavelength for an area given as pi squared, or a factor of the force of the bending of microgravity, the force that causes all points in the universe to expand apart from each other, as microgravity is perpetually self-generative and repulsively charged toward matter energy, being that is on the degree of frequency where it is thought to be so improbable for it to exist in the confines of our universe. In the presence of its finer aspect, the larger solid particles of the longer wavelengths of energy, that the likelihood of it is so infinitesimal that it is considered antimatter, or otherwise, bordering on being opposite possible reality. The formula for time is thus given as phi over pi. That is, the formula for a hypercube that is contained within and surrounding a sphere. That it is set to work measuring the difference of that sphere, so that as the sphere expands, so does the hypercube. On the day of the fifth dimension, let there be light. For as we are given to know of consciousness and sleep, and of day and night, so too do we know of the nature of these tachyons. In the proper conditions, they can be observed in the three-dimensional matter-energy universe, where, true to form, they can be measured by instruments before the time it would take a photon, resultant from the same events from which they derived, to arrive. In these cases, we see that they are able to utilize the same factor of the uncertainty of existence as a probability and potential to quantum tunnel through solids moving from one point on the surface of a virtual particle to a point exactly on the opposite side, not by going through the center of the atom, nor by following a curve defined by the orbit of its electron but by passing into and then out of the electron itself, which can be at all points on its orbital shell at any time, where it does not manifest trajectory spin as a probability, like a photon being absorbed or emitted by an electron, but warp spin as it is swallowed up into itself between the two points, consumed in hyperspace, 
where the point it disappeared and the point it reappeared are the same point and the tachyonic wormhole itself fills the space between them such that spin is conserved by the tachyon. The realm of hyperdimension or the hyperreal warping of the fabric of space-time so that it is always consuming and regenerating itself simultaneously is the surface of a geometry in pure dimension also and this is the origin of spin wave mechanics. In the sixth dimension there is potential light that is the absence of space as a continuum of vortices and the absence of time as this substance in motion. Here is the dark pit from whence we started. It is the black hole of the larger universe that ours lives in, between which various frequencies of microwave vibration are shared, though it only looks light because the light of spin burning off pure potential that is our universe, is so dim compared to the speed and involution of the greater light of this field equivalent to the electromagnetic torus surrounding the singularity of a black hole as we know them, on the inside of which wormholes to alternate universes form. Thus it is truly here, in the quantum foam of spontaneously absurgent probabilities, that we see the connection points between such wormholes form as a gravitational microwave length that is the history of a single tachyon, and thus we see how our own universe formed as well. The seventh dimension is that of potential information, where all pure data is truly relative and thus it is said to be the dimension of dimensions, that is, the one dimension containing the differing geometries of all the others, and providing for them a basis for their continuous contiguity. It is for this reason, for example, that we can say there is no division between multiverses in hyperdimension, where the geometry governs fine waveforms. For the same reason, there are different divisions in the manifest realm of basic matter-energy exchange governed by entropy. So there is subspace, so there is hyperspace in hyperdimension, the hyperreality of the multiverse, and so there is the pure dimension of the primary clear light called Yelem. To this end, they say, that the Creator rested. A. The Universe and Us Now Because the speed of a photon measures the time it takes a photon to travel a certain distance, as well as that distance itself. When we say that the furthest known galaxies from our own are 11 to 15 billion light years away, it means that the light we are receiving from them today also left them 11 to 15 billion years ago. According to 20th century mathematical calculations, the lifespan of the different types of stars, the most common individual evolution of which transforms one form of star into another, along a portion of its existence called the main sequence, is only 100 million years. After this, the star spends a short while as a red or white dwarf. The red dwarf star burns out, but a white dwarf star becomes a black hole. These black holes become supermassive until there is no longer any surrounding quantum matter for them to feed their gravity well, at which point they expel the additional matter that expanded their event horizon around the central singularity. 
at this point in the universe, all that remains are naked singularities and fluid dynamic background radiation. This has probably already occurred for the furthest regions of the known universe, if stars remain homogeneously predictable according to universally applicable laws of physics, which depend on dimensions, which depend on geometries. Similarly, the nearby galaxy of Andromeda in the Virgo cluster may have already crashed into our own Milky Way galaxy, the light from this not having reached us yet. According to our observations today, this galaxy, the only one in the visible universe whose light is blue-shifted, meaning that the source is approaching us, is a little more than two million light-years away, which means that, if it has already collided with the Milky Way, it would have had to have happened less than two million years ago, minus the combined duration of pre-collision trajectories of the two galaxies. Our solar system began as a giant, solid planet the size of the Oort cloud. It was covered in temporal wormholes, and so has become remembered as wormwood. The sun was at its core, and when it ignited, the solid surface shattered and crumbled into an enormous gyroscope. This pivoted around ten times, forming a new planet each time the three rings aligned. The orbits of these planets are unstable over the aeons, and some have come closer or moved further away from the sun. While the Oort cloud has largely dispersed into a loose, spherical field of frozen asteroids far around the outer circumference of the solar system, occasionally comets are still drawn down from within it on elliptical orbits that pass through the solar system. There are various anomalies of the planets that may have been caused by the cyclical drawing down of comets measured by the sunspot cycle. Of these are included the red spot of atmospheric storm on Jupiter, as well as the sideways rotational axis of Neptune. Pluto itself might have at one time been one of these such comets, as well as Vulcan, the very small moon closest to the Sun. On all the moons and planets, without atmosphere in our solar system, there are large craters that can only have been caused by such space debris, and the asteroid belt, separating the solid planets from the gas giants, is testimony of an unspeakable cataclysm that probably resulted from the complete destruction of a very nearby planet at a time before life began on Earth. 1. Description of the Earth and the Heavens The Earth is a huge orb that turns slowly around itself in one direction. Because of the metallic ores produced in its crust friction, as well as supported by the holographic force upon the entire Earth by the gravity well, generated by the Earth's mass and stimulated by its rotation. The Earth itself is magnetically and electrically charged. The poles of the gravitational rotational axis of the Earth and those of the electromagnetic field do not currently coincide. They are offset from one another by about 11 degrees. It is not known if they originally coincided when either or both of them first began. It is postulated that there has been a difference between them for as long as they have existed. However, there is no evidence to support such. The Earth could not have had either of these poles in their present condition 
earlier than when a large asteroid struck the Earth, shearing away a portion of its surface into a debris field in tight orbit around the remains of the Earth, and in this way creating what have come to be the Earth and the Moon today. This, of course, only could have occurred at a time earlier than the iron core of the Earth had been smelted from the molten magma of the mantle, and this itself happened long before the gases given off by the cooling crust atop the lava mantle condensed into clouds and formed the thousands of years of rain that created the ocean, where the trench microbes first appeared even much later, and where our story began. The moon has very little gravity because it is not of a very dense consistency, about equal to that of Earth's mantle. However, it has no strong electromagnetic polarity, because its mass contains few magnetic minerals, and because its sidereal revolution, 27.322 days, and its synodic rotation, 29.53 days, are so nearly equal, differing by only 2.208 days due to the movement of the Earth relative to the Sun, which adds to the position of the Moon relative to the Sun, effectively canceling out the difference over time by averaging, as opposed to the difference of revolutions and rotations of the Earth, which makes 365.25 daily rotations on its axis during one yearly solar orbit, giving Earth's much greater mass a much greater electromagnetic field, the only averaging of the difference for which with that of the Sun occurs relative to galactic core. Even though the same side of it is always facing us because of its synchronous rotation and orbit, the face of the moon that we can see has large, evenly rounded impact craters implying relatively right-angled collisions. The source of any such debris large enough or propelled fast enough to leave such scarring on the fine dust surface of the moon could only have been its nearest overshadowing, sheltering neighbor, us. In particular are the Copernicus and Ptolemaeus craters, the former much deeper and younger than the latter. Because there is no electromagnetic polarity, a compass on the moon would not move. The charged iron pointing any direction the compass is held there are some places on the Earth where compasses turn wildly around because they are in a magnetic bubble where there is no polarity and are detecting the presence of polarity outside the bubble. One such place is the magnetic South Pole. Another is the Bermuda Triangle. One thing that could create such a magnetic bubble effect is an impacted asteroid. It would have high mineral and metallic content, thus becoming strongly magnetized, but because it was not necessarily rotating around a single fixed axis before impact, it would have no polarity relative to that of the Earth. Nor would the metallic mass assume the greater or outside polarity. The stimulated electrons would homogenize to a disordered state equivalent statistically to the same effect as equal possible attraction to either pole. It is also possible to create a magnetic bubble artificially. Whenever electricity is used, it generates such an autonomously polarized magnetic field. Similarly, it is also possible for a magnetic bubble to be left behind in an area even if the initial instrument that created it is removed. The Earth's own electromagnetic field is such a bubble formed by its charged iron core. It is known from the examination of the orientation of layering in the formation of rock 
containing deposits of iron around the world, that the Earth's electromagnetic field has changed the directional charge of its polarity at several times since its formation following the collision that formed the Moon. However, it is unlikely that the collision of a comet or asteroid would account for this. The Sun also has an electromagnetic field, but because it is composed of ignited gas, its rotation is not equally distributed. The surface around the poles rotates faster than the surface around the equator. This causes the middle of the magnetic field to be pulled around along with the equatorial rotation and causes the electromagnetic field to wrap itself up around the Sun. The visible results of this are sunspots where the invisible electromagnetic field itself is crossing from one to another of its bands, prominences, where some of the surface plasma of the Sun follows along one of these cross-jumping bands, and flares, where some of the plasma breaks out of the banding and ejects a jet of radiation into space. When the electromagnetic field is coiled as tightly as it can get, the Sun's poles reverse, and the field resets itself. This happens in a cycle determined by the alignment of the ecliptic with the center of the galaxy. It is possible that this is an effect that is caused by the determination of the obliquity of the Sun's ecliptic relative to the center of the galaxy by the difference squared between the Sun's mass and the distance to galactic core, whereby whenever any star's equator aligns with the nearby black hole, such as at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, its magnetic poles reverse. However, when this happens, it may affect the electromagnetic fields of all the planets in the solar system as well. In any event, there is some reason that the 25,920 year processional cycle has been traditionally divided up into 12 signs, each lasting about 2,148 years. Because not only the Sun at equinox and solstice move through these ecliptic constellations, but the Moon as well, the year has also come to be divided up into 12 months. Similarly, for some great amount of history, perhaps even since the invention of the first sundial, the day has been divided up into about 12 hours, which match also onto the night. It is easy to mark the four seasons by the perihelion and aphelion of the Earth to the Sun. It is possible to match these also onto the Sun and galactic core, just as the Moon is always in a different but predictable place in its fixed 11 degrees tilted orbit around the Earth, when the Earth is at perihelion, equinox, and aphelion, solstice, so is the Earth in a different but predictable place in its fixed 23.5 degrees tilted orbit around the Sun when the Sun is at perigee and apogee to galactic core. Thus, if any of our local planets in their tilted orbits align with the equator of the Sun, when it reaches its zenith relative to the center of the Milky Way, there might be events on their electromagnetic field. So, similarly, the Earth's rotational and electromagnetic poles have been gradually coming closer and closer to being aligned. When this happens, the free energy, gravitational, and the charged energy, electromagnetic, 
can compound one another, and the Earth be transformed into a giant dynamo. The end result is that the magnetic poles reverse, and when they do this, they are repelled from their position overlapping the rotational poles. This does not cause the electromagnetic poles to move, however, because they are now held in place by the Sun. Instead, the rotational axis of the Earth is moved in the same direction that the electromagnetic pole moved to overlap it, and to a distance determined by the strength of the electromagnetic over gravitational surge caused by their overlap. It is known that the north pole of the rotational axis has occupied at least three different positions over the past 80,000 years. The Yukon, 117,250 to 80,000 years ago. The Greenland Sea, 80,000 to 50,000 years ago and Hudson Bay, 50,000 to between 17,000 and 12,000 years ago, most likely 11,600 years ago, causing crustal displacement from 15,000 to 10,000 years ago, before moving to its present location in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. This can cause many types of other changes as well, Volcanic activity, tectonic shifting, continental drift, rapid glaciation, and complete crustal displacement are all possibilities, as well as the displacement of the planetary bodies from their proper orbits, or the movement of a body in the Kuiper belt or Oort cloud. There is still no explanation, for example of the volcanic activity on a moon of Jupiter, geysers on a moon of Saturn, and gas jets on a moon of Neptune, since all these are outside the asteroid belt and considered too far away from the Sun to receive enough radiation for there to be heat enough for such conditions to exist. The effect all depends on the placement of the planets in the ecliptic relative to the alignment of the Sun and galactic core. Since this is a cyclically recurring process, it can be understood to account for any form of naturally occurring global scale event one can imagine. However, it can only be linked definitively to the 41,000 year cycle of the Ice Ages. It is possible that the Earth did not acquire the 23.5 degree angle of inclination of its rotational axis, and thus the 26,000 year cycle of precession did not begin until this time. Precession moves the Earth's vision of the cosmos, one 360th its circumference per 26,000 298 days, 72 years. It moves one seventy-second of a degree every five years. It has processed the North Polar Star from Vega to Polaris over the past 13,000 years and shifted the alignment between the constellation and the ecliptic zodiac and the spring equinox sunrise in the opposite direction as the course of the moon and the sun seen from the earth in their orbits along the same path by one of the twelve constellations every 2,166 years, eight months on average. 2,000 years ago the sign of the vernal equinox was Aries, whereas now the first yearly spring sunrise occurs between Taurus and Gemini, as the age of Taurus is just ending and the age of Gemini just beginning. Thus the zodiac changes 
relative to the seasons. As the sun's electromagnetic field resets itself when the solar system's orbital ecliptic, the zodiac, aligns with galactic core at the center of the Milky Way where it coincides with the constellation Sagittarius. The ecliptic may have been divided into 12 signs or houses now known as the lunar mansions or months in the solar or sidereal year to mark a 2000 year cycle of alternating sunset and sunrise in Sagittarius relative to the four yearly seasons of the inclined earth that might have a simultaneous effect upon polar climate conditions due to electrolysis of salinization to the alternation of the earth's electromagnetic polarity relative to the resetting differential electromagnetic field of the sun one way to observe the earth's 23.5 degree angle of inclination from perpendicularity to its plane of orbit around the sun at least in combination with that of the orbital plane of the moon from the sun is by seeing that the craters on the moon during the span of one night as the moon seems to move through the sky as the surface of earth turns around as earth rotates on its polar axis seem to change position relative to earth's true north the most probable reason for the division of the zodiac into twelve signs lies in the mathematics of precession itself the twelve signs each have three deacons making thirty six each of these deacons has day and night aspects bringing the number to seventy two the sum of the three deacons with their day and night aspects 5 times 72 therefore is 360 the number of degrees in a circle or the 5 and 1 fourth days fewer than the number of days in a solar year that were holy to the Egyptians if we combine the two calendars of the 360 degree year and the 365 and a fourth day year, they synchronize every 1,461 Sothic years. During the eighth Sothic synchronization, 116 solar years after 11,688 Sothic years or 42,369 solar days after 4,269,042 Sothic days, that is, 4,311,411 solar days of 365 and a fourth day years, or 4,308,460 days of 365 day years that is in total after 11,804 years some global event transpires this was recorded in the Sothic calendar of the Egyptians the Mayan Bactun where 11,804 years was 227 Katun of 52 ton as well as the 384 and one-fourth day-night lunar calendar of the Chinese I Ching, all of which claim to be descended from an elder Atlantean calendrical model. These place the most probable date of the Atlantean cataclysm some 11,781 years ago from the year 2000 AD, or 11,804 years before December 21, 2012, on July 27, 9,792 B.C. 
It is also possible that the super-civilization that erected stone megaliths throughout the world earlier than the building of the pyramids, those who founded the first coastal communities during the last ice age, the people we call the Clovis people, or Atlanteans, discovered the remnants of an even earlier culture. Perhaps what they found were dinosaur bones, since this all occurred in the era when a star in the constellation we now know as the dragon was above the North Pole. Although it is possible that they unearthed evidence of another ancient, lost super-civilization. Modern Homo sapiens have existed for four processional cycles. This means that Polaris is approximately our birth star. That's why this is the star I know as Lucifer. This also gives modern Homo sapiens 104,000 years in which to reach the state we're in. Consider the fact that most of the modern technological luxury we take for granted is the product of only the last 100 years.